Mrs. Wilberforce. Yes. I understand you have rooms to let. You've had three weeks of masquerade as a French nobleman. And now it is time for you to change back and return to your provincial university. And if I refuse? Two men, physically as alike as twins, but complete strangers. The one dedicated to sin, the other tricked into changing places. <laughs> Another of these desert-loving English. Hello there. Jock Sinclair, acting colonel. It's humbug, I tell you. It's a lot of... Ah! Three great projects for the nation. The fall of... Of Lazarus and the Last Judgment. Mr. Jimson? Uh, no, that's my first cousin, once removed, an artist who's always getting into trouble with the police. He just went up the road. Shall I call him back? What have I done? <laughs> It's a thing that always fascinates me when I talk to actors, particularly great actors, about how you build a part, about what comes first in, in building up a character and this sort of thing. I always find, too, by the way, that actors don't like being asked this question very much. And I can tell by your face that you're not much savouring it either. No, well, I don't know. Well, thank I really you, don't that's what I you say. Uh, <laughs> you know, I don't know how one, you know, obviously one's imagination and what the author has presented one on the script are, are vitally important. Um, if I get stuck, uh, actually that Lavender Hill mob part, um, which we've just seen that, I, I did, based on two things, um, I, I went to the zoo and in the rodent house, in the small rodents, I saw some little round-eyed, um, nervous -y little character, rather sort of fluffy, and I thought, hmm, maybe that's some... Um, Maybe something on those lines. And then I realized that a bank clerk at my bank looked very much like it. So I, <laughs> settled, <laughs> I settled on the bank clerk's voice. There were two clips, both with no R's. I'm, play, I'm playing with the Fagan and that. Um, so that was a kind of very much a bit of observation and tilted up, of course, yes. no end. Uh, but when I have got stuck, I have very often uh, gone to the zoo and see if some animal would give me some really? clue. Mm. Why the zoo? Well, the only place where you can find strange animals around. <laughs> um, when I did Richard III in Canada, I'd spent a lot, a lot of time, uh, it, I searched around, I thought, an eagle maybe, and no, I'm not, I'm not really kind of an eagle type. And then I, then I found um, a creature called the unsociable vulture. <laughs> and that's in, it, I used to visit him, oh, you know, um, Every two or three days, he got to know me. He was very kind of, <laughs> kind of full of. He was quite a sociable chap, actually. <laughs> but I mean, what were you getting from the unsociable <clears throat> vulture, Sir Alec, that you could possibly use on stage? <clears throat> oh, some, some, I don't know what, some something little, uh, some little something at the back of my mind, or indeed maybe a, a walk or a mannerism or uh, something like that. I mean, how c c could you demonstrate, say? Um, um, uh, a notion you had once with a, a bird or something to show me exactly what you uh, mean. Well, I think I, <laughs> I first sort of got the idea that animals might be helpful in my profession uh, before the war in the Cairo Zoo. I was on tour playing Hamlet, uh, and there was a bird <coughs> there called a shoebill. It's all right if I stand up, mm, because I, I don't think I can do this anymore. Um, but it, it's a, it stands about that high, and it's, it's gray very soberly, pale grey, and it doesn't like being watched. That appealed to me, no end. Um, it likes to watch other people, uh, and it, it has a very, very big beak, rather like a, a kind of shape of some enormous shoe, a great big grey thing there, and a little eye out there. And I first spotted it, and it was standing on, on, on one, one foot with a kind of little tail out. Stand up. Um, 
and kind of eyeing one. And I noticed that whenever I turned away, it moved, but it would never move uh, while I was watching it. So you have to sort of <laughs> pretend to, every time I say, nah, you really have to turn away and look back. So he was standing looking at me, and one would say, now, and turn away, and then you, you turn back and one would <laughs> <laughs> So, but how did you use that in the in the part of Hamlet? Oh, I don't say. I, oh, I didn't play. I didn't play Hamlet. <laughs> like like that. No, I did have a disastrous Hamlet later on, but it wasn't through doing a bird. <laughs> no, it gave me the idea that maybe I would get some sort of amusing <laughs> kind of movement or something from from animals. I'm very devoted to animals. You are? Uh, yes, indeed. Uh, and I'm, I love watching them. Uh, in Salon later, may I tell a little sort of animal please story? Do, please do, please um, do. I, I love the elephants one saw around. And one afternoon I went down to watch a lot of elephants uh, working, uh, pushing great tree trunks down into the river, which was a very fast river, and all, all the elephants except one <coughs> uh, rolled these big trees down into the river with uh, that part of their nose kind of pushing and rolling very successfully, very skillfully and very soberly. Uh, they pushed on thing and the tree would get into the water and gradually kind of get shifted away by the current. But there was one enormous rogue elephant there um, with a chain round his tummy, which meant that he probably killed someone. But he was a very wise, huge old fellow um, with some great big floppy ears going around. And he didn't do this at all. He pushed it as if it was a, a, a pencil. He kind of got his nose and pushed it the difficult way towards the water. And I thought, now why? Because one or two people said, no, you watch that elephant. Um, and some of the film crew were rugging around, silly old so-and-so, you know, look at him, why didn't he just roll it like the others? That kind of goes down. And it was as if he heard them, because he, um, he was very, very slow in all his kind of movements, the way he kind of <laughs> came and, and pushed the, this huge tree and the little eye kind of took us all in. And he thinks, you think I'm a fool, don't you? And the others are all clever ones. And he very, very slowly moved, left it, moved round. And as he just got back, he gave us all a little tiny, wicked look and flipped it with his back <laughs> 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 You mentioned there watching out, observing animals, and sometimes you get an idea for a, a walk from an animal. Um, in fact, um, you've been on record as saying that you only really start getting into a park when you get a walk. Is that right? Yes, so, I, mean, I, I think so. Um, I don't sort of feel happy until I'm doing it from the ground upwards, so to speak. Mm -hmm. uh, this used to be very self-consciously done when I was a student and it really came because I had no money to spend. I could allow myself sixpence a week and there was really no entertainment. I used to spend that sixpence a week on going to the gallery at the Old Vic uh, and the rest of the time was following people in the street, uh, you know, surreptitiously of course. And uh, I used to follow people and watch their walks and I felt I got to know something about them and I, I used to imitate their walks behind them. Uh, really? Uh, and I began to feel at least I know their mood or that they're in or whatever their ailments are or whatever it might be. And that kind of got rather stuck. Uh, I don't do it now. I don't, <laughs> I don't, or I very seldom nowadays at laziness um, consciously observe what someone's doing. Yes. Um, I, I've lived on that store for many years. I really should store up again, I suppose. Yes, I suppose that, uh, at, that when you're in a park, then you draw something from the back of your mind that you observed some time ago, the way somebody mm. moved. Uh, well, I, I th think it's got to become um, 
or for me anyway, got to kind of become unconscious again. I mean, there was a time when I used to consciously think, I remember seeing that man do that, as probably I did in the Lavender Hill mob film. Um, but it's kind of best if you've forgotten and comes up again and you don't quite know where it's come from. What about that famous walk in River Kwai? You ah. mentioned the film there. When you've been put in that awful isolation yeah. thing, you had that extraordinary staggering or lurching walk across yeah. the parade ground when they let you go. Where did that come from? Well, that, that's a sort of very personal one. Uh, but it, it's true because it shows the funny process that does go on with, uh, with an actor, maybe. My son had polio when he was about 12 and was paralyzed from the waist down. He's fine now. I mean, he can, you know, plays rugger and, and rushes around, does any, whatever he wants. Um, <clears throat> but when he was recovering um, and walking again a bit, it was obviously a very stiff, strange walk. And I had a little cynic camera. Um, and I remember when he was first walking, taking shots of this. And then when one saw it on the screen, my wife and I persuaded ourselves that he was fine. He was walking fine. But obviously, deep down inside, one, one thought, oh, Lord, he's going to limp for life or something you know, of that nature. And years later, when it came to doing uh, that scene on the River Kwai, I found myself doing the identical walk that I had on that little cine camera uh, from five, six years previously. Uh, I'd entirely forgotten. I didn't know I was doing it. It was only when I saw myself on the screen, I thought, where on earth did that curious, slightly lurchy, bent walk come from? It was the same as I had on the cine camera. It was extraordinary. 